Now, our first speaker is uh, for this section is uh, Joseph Barascano, and I think everybody knows uh, Dr. Barascano. He's had over two year, two decades of uh, experience. He's been on virtually every media. Um, he's advised the CDC and the NIH. He's testified in the Senate and with the armed forces. Uh, and he's a founding member of ILADS. And he's also a board member on the International Lyme and Associated Disease Educational Foundation. He's um, been an experienced clinician. He, he's written his guidelines and revised them many times. And many people have used those as a very helpful how-to source. And uh, he's also developed a lot. And he's uh, doing newly discovered retrovirus HPV and uh, work with chronic He does consultation work with various nutritional supplement companies, which he has quite an interest. So now he's working full time with uh, in biotech arena doing research. So, Dr. Barascano, happy to have you. This forward, backward, you have to point it to the right. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. This is the first lecture in our educational series um, for this weekend, and we're going to start off with what we used to be calling the nuts and bolts, or um, basically how to get started in Lyme. So for those of you who have not heard me before, I have to tell you that I speak quickly. I have like 4,000 slides. I'm just exaggerating. Tells I'm a secretary, I'm a board member, but the bottom one says I'm a troublemaker, and that's so true. <laughs> okay. First of all, I want to start by saying what actually is Lyme disease? I love Bernie Raxon's discussion this morning, his new definitions, because Lyme, in my mind, especially as someone who's got chronic Lyme, is always a mixture of different pathogens. So when I say Lyme disease, it's a broad definition, including not just Lyme, but the co-infections, and not just the co-infections, but also reactivation of latent infections that people may have that surface when the immune system gets weakened and damaged from the Lyme disease. Um, we also know that Lyme can be transmitted not just by tick bites, but from mother to fetus. Um, it's not clear whether other vectors can transmit Lyme. Uh, we don't know if it's possible to transmit Lyme on person-to-person -person contact, even though that has been proven in animals. So it's still, I like to define Lyme more broadly. And I can't get the machine to go. There it goes. All right. Now, to understand the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme, you really have to understand as much as you can about the biology of the organism. Um, first of all, there are not many spirochetes in the Lyme infection. You saw that just earlier with the fluorescent studies. But these spirochetes, when they're in the tissues, they give off a lot of biological products that are very immune stimulatory, immunogenic. They can be membrane fractions, they can be fragments of DNA and a number of other compounds. And so what happens is these secreted compounds initiate a huge immune system reaction. It's almost kind of a low-grade continual cytokine storm. So you're dealing with not just an infectious disease, but one of immune system activation. The other thing is that Borrelia can change its morphology. It can exist in a spiral form, as you saw in the fluorescent videos. These spiral forms have a cell wall, and therefore it can be killed by cell wall drugs. They also can exist in what are called round bodies, cystic forms, and L forms. They don't have a cell wall, but they can be killed by other antibiotics. So knowing that the spirochete can shift based on where they live and what exposure they have to different antibiotics, that can help guide you in terms of making a better uh, treatment decision. Um, Another thing, Borrelia make what's called an S layer, slime layer is basically what that means. And an S layer is the beginnings of a biofilm. Now we've seen over the last few years work by Dr. Sapi and others that biofilm is a very important thing when you look at Borrelia and culture. What's not yet known is whether biofilm exists in living systems. Um, research looking for that is being done at University of New Haven but under Dr. Sapi. So if anyone of you out here, I'm just telling you this for her benefit, um, sees a patient with erythema migraines and does a biopsy of the rash or has a biopsy of synovial tissue, please let her know because she would love to have some of those tissues to look for biofilm in living systems. Um, because it's very important in vitro, whether it's in vivo an issue, we don't really know. Now the other thing about Borrelia is that they have a funny way of growing. 
they belong to a family of organisms called relapsing fever Borrelia. So what that means is that they don't grow steadily like other bacteria, they grow in cycles. In Borrelia burgdorferi, the cycle is about four weeks long. So one of the things you see clinically is there's a pattern of patients having symptoms that wax and wane about every four weeks. And that's a very important clue to the diagnosis and also to the management as well. Another thing is when the bacteria are in their dormant phase, let's say every four weeks they wake up and they run around, they cause symptoms, and between phases they're less active. When they're less active, they're not likely to be killed as well by the antibiotics because they're killed during the growth phase. There's a trick to helping your treatment, keeping this in mind, we'll get to in the treatment section. So, we focus mainly in this organization on chronic Lyme disease because that's where the big problems are, as you know. And so how do you define chronic Lyme? Everyone has a different definition because nothing is standardized yet. But I have my own definition based on my observations of patients over the many years where I was in practice. And basically, if someone has been ill for more than a year, I call that chronic Lyme. That doesn't matter whether they've been treated or not, seropositive or not. If you're sick for a year or more with Lyme, I call that chronic Lyme. Now, in the laboratory, we can see that in people who've been sick for more than a year, number of things happen. B cells decrease function and number, T cells decrease function and number. Natural killer cells subset the CD57 that decreases in number. Um, so we know that the immune system does start to break down and I think that's the genesis of why chronic Lyme becomes such a problem. Um, the corollary damage, it's a lot. You know, treating Lyme disease is more than just giving antibiotics. There's effects on the nervous system, on the hormones, on the immune system, even on the mitochondria. So if you don't have an all-encompassing view of how to address a Lyme patient, you're not going to do a complete job of getting them well. So that involves antibiotics, involves lifestyle changes, sometimes nutritional changes, exercise regimens, rest periods, things to help the immune system, maybe hormonal support, things to heal the nervous system damage. So because of the breakdown of the immune system and because the Borrelia seem to set up shop in your, house, in your house, their house, which is your body, um, a couple of things happen. The, more, the longer someone has been ill with Lyme, the more damage that occurs. The longer they've been ill with Lyme, the harder it is for them to get better, the more damage that's done. So again, chronic Lyme is a worse illness than acute or even early Lyme. So now, it also goes with treatment, and what we found roughly is that the longer someone has been ill with Lyme, the longer it's going to take the antibiotic course to get them better. And that's just a rough estimate. I don't have actual numbers, but that's something we've all observed over the years. Now, Lyme is always a clinical diagnosis. Why do we say that? We don't have a laboratory test that's 100% proof that Lyme infection is there. Well, likewise, what if someone has symptoms and Lyme disease and the symptoms are from some other condition separate from the Lyme? So it's always a clinical picture, and that's why you're clinicians. You know, you don't do diagnosis and treatment based on check boxes and some little, you know, test kind of a thing. So it's a clinical diagnosis, and why is that? Only 17% of people who've got confirmed Lyme recall a, a tick bite. So if someone says, we well, can't have Lyme because you don't remember a tick bite, well, you know, the ticks are so tiny. If they bite you back there somewhere, you're not going to find it. Um, and it's not the tick you find and you pull off. It's one you didn't find that's still there that causes the trouble. Second thing is, what about the rash? Um, early literature said you had to have a rash to have Lyme disease, but that's because they only accepted people with rashes in their clinics. Then they went back with their statistics in a circular way. They said, well, you have to have a, you know, a rash. Truthfully, if you take people who have diagnosed Lyme and look back, two different studies from health departments showed only about a third of them recalled a rash. Other studies say about a half. So again, the majority of patients with chronic Lyme don't recall a rash and don't recall a tick bite. Um, so to make the clinical diagnosis, you have to go through the history, see if they have the classic signs and symptoms of Lyme. We'll talk about this a little bit more. You have to do some testing to look for the infection, look for, do some testing to see possible side effects of the infection, for example, CD57 counts. Um, look for um, other things that could be going on, not just co-infections, but also other opportunistic infections. And what I always tell people is don't have on what I call Lyme blinders and blame everything on Lyme disease. A lot of diagnosing Lyme from a clinical point of view is ruling out other diseases because you could have other things that could mimic Lyme, or you could have other things along with Lyme. You never want to blame everything on Lyme and miss something important other than the Lyme. Okay. Come on, machine. Hey, okay. So now, the history. You have a person who's been well and they get sick, um, especially this potential exposure. Now, you know, potential exposure can happen pretty much anywhere around the globe except Antarctica. Um, and classic story, someone went camping or they're, uh, you know, they work outdoors as a landscaper or something 
and little by little they get sick, or they can remember they went away and they came back with an acute illness after the vacation, or their pets have ticks on them. So a history where you know that there's a potential exposure that's part of it. Um, and the way the symptoms evolve over time is also a clue. In the beginning, the symptoms are very nonspecific and like a virus. I mean, you just don't feel well, you're headachy, achy, tired, whatever. Maybe your eyes hurt a little bit. If it's undiagnosed and untreated, what happens is the symptoms get to be a little bit more organ specific. The chronic, the, or the, the general symptoms remain, but then you start to see involvement maybe with joints specifically, or the tendons around a joint, or some neurologic things, some tingles, a bit of dizziness, and so forth, some visual changes. So it starts to become more organ specific, including the heart. Um, over time, um, it becomes a whole body multi system illness. So if someone comes to you and says, you know, for a long time my knee's been sore, but they have absolutely no other symptoms, you know, Lyme is very much less likely. If they say, my knee's been sore, I say, all right, I know that, but what about other joints? And are you tired? And do you have any headaches? And, you know, on and on the list goes. Um, and if you see organ involvement, multiple systems of, in this nature that evolved over time, that's really the clue to the clinical diagnosis. Um, another clue, like I mentioned before, is having this four-week cycle. Now, the list of symptoms, you know, I can fill 10 slides, I'm sure, but the idea is that it's a whole body illness, okay? You have the general symptoms, you have the nonspecific ones, you have the organ specific ones. And most of my patients gain weight for unexplained reasons, have a hard time losing it. They have decreased libido, decreased exercise tolerance. I mean, all these things that indicate a whole body process. Now, you know, many people say, well, you don't have Lyme, you have a depression. Well, the depressed person doesn't have swollen joints or decreased reflexes or abnormal pupils or, or absent gag reflex. So you have to be very thorough in looking for this because the symptoms relate to the illness. But the key really is the pattern, okay? The four-week cycle is very important. What I tell my patients on their first visit, even before the visit, when they get their literature in the mail, is keep a daily diary of your symptoms and rate the days on a scale of one to five and see if they're good days and bad days. And over time, you hold this up and look and see, yeah, there's a pattern for sure. So the four-week cycle is very important. Another thing is that the symptoms tend to migrate and change over time. So if someone comes to you and they say, you know, my knees were killing me for a long time, but they seem to have gotten a little bit better, but now my elbow's kind of sore. Then that seems to have gotten better, but my neck is really stiff. And then I got really confused, and for a few weeks, I don't know what I was doing. I couldn't find my way home, and then, you know what? I seem to have gotten over that, but now, you know, my legs are tingling. So the general doctor said, boy, this person's nuts. <laughs> um, got to see a psychiatrist. But the truth is, this is the way that Lyme evolves. If you see a four-week cycle, multi-system illness that came in a healthy person for no apparent reason, um, and it's migrating around like that, that's a sign there's something living, active in their body causing trouble. Now, if the person's general health is affected by some other things, surgery, a lot of stress, international travel for some reason, these are things that have impact in a negative way on Lyme patients, so it's also important to get that as part of your history. Find out things that made them better, things that made them worse. Is there a pattern? Is there a cycle? The most common physical finding in Lyme usually is a normal physical exam, and that's been told to audiences for many years, but you know, I don't think that's always true. Because if you're very detailed about it, you can actually find a lot of abnormalities on a physical exam in the Lyme patients. Um, look at the general patient. How do they look? Do they look healthy or not? I mean, that's a very valid opening statement in your letters or in your, in your chart letters. <laughs> I don't know if it worked. It melted the lens. Did you see that? <laughs>